announcements I have. And now, if I may, I'd like to introduce our, our speaker who's been decorating the front end of the room here for way longer than she thought she was going to. This is archaeologist Delana Gilmore, and she is from the uh, uh, Gwinnett area, uh, Gwinnett Archaeological Research Society, which is a chapter like Bray, but it's uh, headquartered at uh, Fort Daniel in Gwinnett County. And she's going to talk about that, so I don't need to tell you anything about Fort Daniel. But she is uh, uh, past president and, and now secretary treasurer of GARD. And uh, she's also lives on site at Fort Daniel, so she's sort of keeping an eye on things. Uh, uh, the uh, the other thing she does is she's been active in the Society for Georgia Archaeology for several years, and is currently serving as an editor for the Profile. I had hoped to bring a copy of that with me tonight, and I forgot to. Uh, this is a. Uh, a newsletter that comes out twice, three, twice a year, twice a year uh, online, and you get it as a member of SGA. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, we were hoping to share uh, a printed copy of it with the group tonight, and I just completely forgot about it. But we'll try to see if we can make some sort of connections in the future. Um, okay. Well, that's oh yeah. I wanted to tell you also that. Um, she has a Master of Arts in Archaeology and Heritage from the University of Leicester. Yes. Uh, it's not Leicester, okay? Leicester in England. And she's currently working for a corporation called Environmental Corporation of America as a project manager and historian of uh, doing cultural resources uh, work for that company. Uh, I think it's enough said. Thank you very much for coming to speak to us. And that's my talk. <laughs> Can we dim the lights a little? Yeah, let's do dim the lights, please. Okay. Yeah, just, the okay, hold on a second. Don't, oh, don't, help, help. not, not too much. Thank you for this. Just oh, don't start yet, please. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Folks online, I'm sorry. This is this is a little difficult, but I'm. We're going to get to it here. I'm going to go screen share. Um, screen sharing this thing is tough. Well, as he said, I am I was past president of, of GARS, is what we call it, and we got GARS and Bragg, and then Greater Atlanta are the three chapters of SGA in the metro area. And we always tried to do some things together, but since COVID happened, a lot of things went to the side because we were going to do like a ceramic workshop at Fort Daniel. We, we had an Olympic workshop in the past at Fort Daniel, success with other chapters, but COVID happened, you know, everything shut down for two weeks, right? Just two weeks. It turned out to be three years, right? It's later. But, um, but I understand about with meetings. Sometimes we only had two people show up at our meeting, so I, this is this is a lot of people for me. Are we good? I guess we're good. Okay, okay let's try. I don't. This thing's on top, and I cannot. Well, tonight I am going to talk about a little bit, a little bit about Fort Daniel, a little bit of the history. Some of this is probably, you know, old history to y'all. Probably already know it. I'm trying not to teach you too much history, so since so most of this is, if y'all been born and raised here in Georgia, probably know this. Right? I'm born and raised in Alabama, so I know a lot about the Muscogee Creek. We won't hold that against you. <laughs> hey, boy. <laughs> or the dogs. <laughs> you might get to Alabama on my that. Um, but uh, yeah, I was born and raised in East, East Central Alabama. So right over the Georgia state line. My husband and I, we started dating last century. Hmm. We celebrate our 20th anniversary this coming up 31st of this year, this month. But uh, so when we did things, 
On our dates, we go to Douglasville instead of going to Birmingham. It's the big city. So coming to Georgia is, is natural for us. And then we, in 2010, my husband got a job. He wanted to do something that he wanted to love. He's in sports memorabilia. So he wanted to do his dream job. So he came here to his dream. We moved here to Georgia, to Atlanta area. Since he wanted to do his dream job, I want to do my dream job, which is to be an archaeologist. So after 15 years in the publications world as a copy editor, I decided to get my degree in archaeology. And 13 years later, here I am, living at an archaeological site in my backyard. I'm glad to say that. <laughs> well, Fort Daniel is it's situated in an interesting place. In the late 1700s, here in Georgia, especially in the north, well, actually it's the northwest at the time, but Georgia's a very little sliver of, of stuff, there was the, the Oconee Wars was happening between the colonists, or the recently new Americans, and the Oconees who were part of the, of the Muscogee Creek Federation. They were fighting because, what? Americans wanted their land. Some were crossing over the treaty lines, the borders, and squatting on their land illegally. And so the fighting started happening. Well, because of this, do you want to go to the next? Uh, yeah, I'd love to. There we go. Because of this, in 1793, a letter was sent from General Ilham to the governor, Edward Telfar, there of Georgia, trying to strengthen their forces, the defenses on the frontier of Georgia. But they were very weak. So if you go to the next slide, please show this map. This map shows you, this is Franklin County. And Franklin County is was bigger than it was is today. You see different little squares. Those are forts. So the forts were, were typically basically like a house. Someone's house was a fort with a fence around it. So they weren't really forts. They were just basically homesteads. So Georgia still needed some help. The governor sent um, a, asked aid from the, the, the government. If you want to go to the next slide. So in 1794, Secretary of War, Henry Knox, yes, that Knox, report Knox, he was the Secretary of War under uh, President George Washington. He answered their call. He said, here is you a plan. We are going to give you some help, some money to build these forts every 25 miles. So on the line of the Georgia border, every 25 miles, there was a fort built. And one of those forts was Fort Daniel. If you go to the next slide. But in that letter, we found that Henry Knox sent a guideline, a design for the forts. But the governor said, we don't need this, just file it away. And it was forgotten. Still, there were sports that were built. Uh, Fort Daniel at the time, in the late 1700s, was called Fort at Hog Mountain. We have found some evidence of a, some a fort there underneath all the stuff that we have found at uh, Fort Daniel. But because of this, after the Oconee War happened, of course, the, the natives lost. They had to leave, and most of them went down to south, west, into the Alabama area, south Georgia, and also some of them went into Spanish Florida. And they mingled with the Seminoles. The natives, they don't have short memories. They have long, 
to our memories. When War of 1812 happened, to the next, oh, here's a clearer picture of what the fort looks like. You see the two block houses and then the stables and stuff. Go to the Well, years later, we declare war once again against the British because they were, I say, kidnapping, where they were enforcing Americans to serve the Royal Navy because they needed men to fight against Napoleon. So the Napoleon War was going on, and they needed men, so they're kidnapping Americans, saying that they were British citizens, even though they had papers saying that they were Americans. Well, then President James Madison declared war against the United States. So the British was having two wars going on at the same time. They're fighting Napoleon, then they're fighting us again. Well, once again, they're trying to encourage the Native people to side with them because they needed the extra men to fight. But they didn't want to. The majority of them did not want to. Most of them, the was Cherokee and the Muscogee, they remembered that they sat through the British during the, war, uh, the Revolutionary War and they lost a lot of land. So they decided to side with the United States. But a small group of Muscogee Creek natives decided to side with the British. But at the same time, they were promised that their land would be given back to them. This small group of Muscogee Creeks were very upset against their leadership. Because their leadership, the chiefs, were selling land to the United States so that they can build the Federal Road from Atlanta, well, not Atlanta, but from Georgia down to Mobile. Well, the Native believed that the land belongs to no one. It belongs to everybody. Well, most of these chiefs were buying, were selling this land to the United States so they could build their road, <laughs> so they could probably build taverns and little hotels and stuff like that so they could get money. And they, and they were getting rich off this. Well, these small this small band of Muscogee Creek, they did not like that because they wanted to go back to their the old beliefs. So they're upset with their leadership. If you go to the next. So in August of 1813, in South Alabama, a small group of Muscogee Creeks were called the Red Sticks attacked a fort called Fort Mims. And this actually is called the, the massacre at Fort Mims. Because only there are 50, 550 feet, 550 settlers. We don't know how many enslaved people, because of course I didn't count the enslaved people. All of them were killed, except a handful of people were able to escape. Because of this, the story spread. Go to the next slide, please. Benjamin Hawkins. You probably know a little bit about him. He's a, at this time, he was the U.S. Indian agent. He's referring to Fort Hawkins. That's him. He was very friendly. He had uh, good relations with the Muscogee Creeks. He, so he kept on hearing rumors about what happened at Fort Mims. And he kept on hearing that the Red Sticks were going to come up the Federal Road because hey, it was already built, why not come up an easy path and come all the way up to Hog Mountain. You're like, where is Hog Mountain? Well, Hog Mountain is called today Buford Venticula. Is that the Highway 324, 124? And we're right there. It's also where Fort Daniel. So they're coming to the fort at Hog Mountain. Yeah. To the next slide. Because of this, 
General Alan Daniel, who is the commander of the 4th Division, the Georgia Militia issued orders for the fort at Hog Mountain to be rebuilt. Because I told you at the time, there was still a fort, but it was, this is, the fort was, the old fort was built in the 1790s. So this is what, 20 something years later. It was in bad condition, so they told him to tear that down and to build a new fort. But they didn't know what fort to use. And then suddenly they remember these plans from 20 years ago that Henry Knox gave out. So here they said, here's a plan, here's what you can do. So from that plan, Fort Daniel was built by the local people. And, uh, but not only the local people helped to build it, a lot of people also was able to give uh, some supplies. So this fort started being built in October of 1813. Which is excellent. This is the letter actually that General uh, Alan Daniel sent to the leader of the Fort Daniel at the time. Well, the Fort of Hog Mountain. It tells you how he said build the new fort. Tear it down and build a new fort. But at this time, you got, we got this Muscogee Creek Confederation having their own little civil war going on in Alabama. Fort Mims happened. So we needed fortifications along, a little bit stronger fortifications along the, the frontier. Get to the text. Well, here enters Mr. George Gilmore. No relations to me. So, because sometimes it's spelled Gilmore. He was received commission as first lieutenant. George Gilmore later became Governor Gilmore. At this time, he was given orders to take a small group of men to go to friendly territory with the Muscogee Creek and to build a fort. So he gathered his men. Go to the next slide. And uh, he. He lived on the Broad River, so at Fort Washington, where they gathered. They came to Fort Daniel, gathered up some more men, and they headed out towards the Chattahoochee to build a fort along the Chattahoochee. Well, they really didn't have a road. And prior to this building the fort at Fort uh, over at the Chattahoochee, you see right here, that very good looking picture. Um, oh, it's an old map from the 1820s. They wanted to start doing supply route. Because at this time, got two armies in Alabama. I got Andrew Jackson, his army, and another army in, in the South trying to protect American interests in Alabama and also to help Muscogee Creeks who are trying to reside with them. But they didn't have, they were running out of supplies quickly. So an idea came up to use the Chattahoochee as a supply route. Go down the Chattahoochee to go to Fort Mitchell, which today is uh, on that in Alabama, but it's right below the um, Columbus, the Fort uh, Phoenix City you know, area. So, but there was no way to give, get the supplies to the Chattahoochee. So a road was ordered to be built from Fort Daniel to the fort that's going to be on the Chattahoochee. That fort became to be known as Fort Peachtree because across the river there was a Muscogee Creek village called Standing Peachtree. Well, that road from Fort Daniel to Fort Peachtree started becoming. See this little one right here. This on maps was start started roads and standing peach tree. It was the first peach tree road. It's because of this little fort and that little road that we have all these peach tree roads. And if people ask me, is it peach tree or is it peach tree? 
it is peach tree. There has been um, archaeological investigations, excavations at different villages throughout Georgia, and they have found evidence of old peach tree orchards. Actually, there's been documentations of that. The theory is, is that when this Spaniard peach growers came through Georgia, the monks had peach seeds from, and they gave them to the natives. So they made these orchards. So that's up to y'all. Somehow it is a peach tree. Here's the next slide. <clears throat> keep on going. Yeah, keep on going. That's the next slide. One more? One more, yeah. Keep going? Yeah. Here we go. Here's the map I was looking for. Tell you how maps are. See, here is Hog Mountain towards Fort Daniel. But this map that was made in 1814 put Hog Mountain outside the United States. So it tells you how these maps are not very accurate. Rock Mountain at Stone Mountain. So that gives you an idea. And then this right here is Fort Peachtree, which is right there on Peachtree Creek, and then Chattahoochee. Today, it is the Land to Water Works. That gives you an idea of what Fort Peachtree would be today. Go to them. But because of this, we were able to do some archaeological investigations at Fort Daniel to discover all this. Not only digging in the dirt, we also went to the archives. And that's where we actually found the copy of the, we call it the Knox plan, of the, the plan that Secretary Knox sent to the governor of Georgia. It was, I said, it was filed away, it was forgotten, but from our investigations, we found that the Knox plan is what Fort Daniel was made out of, was built. And we we're figuring that Fort Peachtree was also built that way because Lieutenant Gilmer, he never built a fort. He was ordered to build a fort. So here, go. He didn't know how to build a fort. The only forts he's seen was Fort Washington and Fort Daniel. So we were thinking that maybe Fort Peachtree was also built that way. And the other forts that we have, um, the sister forts, like Fort Harrison, which is the one that's up north of Fort Daniel. We're trying, we're actually trying to find some of these other forts that were still sisters to Fort Daniel. From our research that we've done at the archives and from local historical societies and oral history, thinking that is also the same plan as a fort as an ox plan. But because of this, we know. We, so Using Grand Pentrain radar, we were able to find the outline of the fort. And that's where we can say we know the Fort Daniel was based off the Knox plan because of the Grand Pentrain radar. You see right here the decoloration, that's the, the wall of the fort. But when we first started investigating here, we did use metal detectors. This land was farmland before, after the fort was abandoned. So we, we did bell detection. We found a lot of, I said earlier, talking about the, um, the bales we found them from the previous owner who used to own the property, had bales around the property to keep, uh, around her garden to keep the deer out. Uh, but we also found a lot of nails. Not only nails that were like machine made, also there are handmade nails that date to the time of the first fort, also to the fort of Daniel, which is the next one. <clears throat> These are some of the artifacts that we have been found. Uh, this right coin right here is the 1776 Mexican minted Spanish coin. Now, 1776 is a good year, right? That's when we won our independence. 
why that coin was this is the only treasure you ask to see if I treasure. This is the only treasure you everything's a treasure to us, but you know, money is what everybody's wanting to know. We do not know the story about this. This could be somebody's lucky coin, or it could be money that they used. Georgia was very close to Spanish Florida, and we didn't have a very stable banking system at that time. So we did use money from the France and also from Spain. We didn't use this British pound because we you know still patriots. But also we found projectile points. Where the, Fort Daniel is based, it's the highest point in Hog Mountain. And you get the mouth of the Appalachia River not far away. So we're finding projectile points that date to early, no, mid archaic down to mid woodland period. So like 6,000 BC to 600 AD. That's a, wide, that's a lot of time. But the area is high point and you got a water source. So we know that somehow this was a, we have a lot of lithic scatter there. But not only that, we also found some pottery a date to the woodland period. So most likely this area was a woodland period native site as well. And then later on it became a, a fort. You can tell from, we found some musket balls, some buttons, and a good old fashioned, I said silverware, but it's not silverware, but utensils. Couple of teaspoons, soup spoon, a couple of called butter knives, but knives. But also we found a little um two prong fork. Go to the next slide. Get yes. But recently, the past probably about four years, we found this little interesting artifact in one of our um, trenches near the southwest block house this is a substone piece and one of our um carpenters volunteers saying this could be a carpenter's pencil if you look carefully you can probably see where they sharpened into a point so they can mark it when they were cutting down the trees and the branch, the trees and making them level. It's one of the good phrases that goes to the next. Also, we found clay pipes, several pieces of clay pipes. You see here a little burnt, probably got a little bit too hot because clay pipes at that time were cheaply made. They were cheap too as well. So they were brittle. They were they broke easily. And some hot somebody probably just threw that piece away, broke it off, and kept on smoking. We also have a lot of glass. This is my favorite because the blue is my favorite color. <laughs> color blue. We don't know specifically what they were done for, probably um, for medicines. We also found a lot of brown glass which you know, probably they drank beer or alcohol. We also found some etch clear glass, very clear, like your fine glassware that you drink special occasions. So we don't know where that's from, but all this was found somewhere all over the fort. Some of, some of it in the trenches or the, the fort Walls were, but also most of it was found in their block houses. Now this, it doesn't look much like much, but this is a ball and cone, ball and cone earring. That's what native people wore. This is a historic artifact. So we found native prehistoric artifacts, but this is a native historic artifact. 
And from our uh, investigation with local newspaper clippings from the time, we know that there were Cherokee that did trade with the, the locals there. So that could have been a native. Also, we know that Frontiers people also wore native clothing and jewelry. So could have been one of the militiamen too. Not only artifacts can date the site, but also the features. This is one of the lock houses that we have marked out. This is the Southwest lock house. You see in the middle, that little square, the black cover. When we started digging this area, we found stones in the middle. We're thinking they probably just dumped the stones right there and, and left, like foundation stones. Well, we started moving the stones. Here's the next slide. And we found this little, we don't know. We, would, we actually thought it was a fireplace in the middle of a block house. Does that make sense? No. What we figured that this was, was a root cellar in this block house. That's where the food would have been kept. This is the one of the first and only root cellars documented in a fort here in York. Probably in the, at this time period, for this time period as well, probably in the United States. Not only does the block house date, but we also were able to find one of the gates. If you remember the in the um, plan, there was two gates. The form is very small. We got two block houses and you got two gates. So you can go in and go out, go straight in. But from our research and our, from our investigations and from our digging, we only found the one gate. But also, we found out what happened to the fort. The War of 1812 ended, yeah, what, two, three years later. So in 1815, the fort was abandoned. In 1819, Gwinnett County was founded. And then we had the land lottery of 1820. Well, this land was not given out at the time to anybody. It was all just, there was no, there's no name on the, on the land lottery, the things that we looked at. But the fort was still standing. You can look at this, you can see this is charred wood. When the fort was abandoned, it was burnt down so that the people could get the nails. The closest place you could go get nails is in Augusta. This is still the frontier. They didn't have an establishment yet. So we were figuring maybe the fort was burnt down so they can get the nails and use them for themselves. Part of our um, programs at Fort Daniel is to educate the public, public archaeology, preserving the history, telling the local history. We have children from two years old and up, even little babies, little helping us digging at our public events. Excuse me, watch. Not only that, we have students. Give me next. You probably recognize this gentleman in the middle. That's Dr. Glover from Georgia State University. He brings his students out in the fall to do a mini field school, teaching them intro to archaeology class. Not only do we help with the students, but we also teach teachers how to do archaeology. During the summers, part of the Gwinnett County uh, public school systems, the teachers are have to do continual education requirements. And we do have workshops 
at our Fort Daniel to teach them how to do archaeology, but also teach them the local history. This is where your backyard, literally. You can come, we can give you a tour to your students. Or during the summer, you can have campers. This is a history camp from last year. They came out and they had a little mini day at our Fort Daniel, learning the local history of Gwinnett County, the fort itself. I was saying earlier, Gwinnett archeologists and Fort Daniel Foundation members are continuing trying to find, we did some digging at Fort Peach Street in 2014. We uh, were able to get on to the property of the Lens of Water Works and in condition trying to find Fort Peach Street there, the actual location. However, the only thing that we found was one nail that dates to the early 1800s. We did rediscover a Confederate pale. Yeah, I think this is the Chattahoochee and Peachtree Creek. This is right before the Battle of Atlanta. So we found a lot of Civil War bullets. Some were shot and some were not. Also along with that, we found some uh, horseshoes and also a very small uh, donkey shoe. You can tell because it's very small there. So we think it all is from the Confederate uh, encampment. Also, we're trying to find Fort Harrison. I was telling a little bit, mentioned that a little bit earlier. Really, that it's up in um, it's on the old Federal Road up in uh, down for y'all in Hall County. And then we're still looking for the other sites. There was a list of forts and some documentation that we have found, and also the musket, the um, muster rolls from these forts. A lot of the, the Georgia militia, they not only served one fort, they served a couple of forts. Some that served at Fort Daniel also served at Fort Harrison. So that's why we're trying to actually find Fort Harrison. We were things that we know were attacked, but we still need to do a little bit more digging for that. And that is all. Are there any questions? About Fort Daniel? Did you find or have seen any documentation as to why they set distance between them at 25, 25 miles, miles or less? And if you didn't find documentation, then you have any idea why? In the letter that, uh, uh, what's his name? General Daniel had, he said to do it every 25 miles. Why 25 miles? I don't know. Maybe because it's a good round number. Round number. Travel that in a day. Probably. We do know that um, the next fort down south of Fort Daniel is about 30 miles. So we really it's probably between 25 to 30 miles, but we, we don't know why it's 25 miles. It's just that in that letter that we found, it's the only time that was mentioned. So by horseback or by wagon, maybe. Yeah. They'd have to be over some sort of improved road. Yeah. 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 That's why they're building Fort Peachtree, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Did, did, did I understand you to say that the, that the uh, pattern you found for the fort was the very earliest? Yes. From that earliest map or earliest drawing? Yes. We When we did the Grand Panjang radar, we noticed that the ground disturbances, we had the two block houses and then with the, the trenches. So when we went to the um, archives, we did some digging and we found that the Knox, we'll call it the Knox plan. Yeah. Right. That. Did you, have you found any evidence that any of the forts were built to the Knox plan? Only Fort Daniel. We did find some um, documentation that Fort Daniel, the Knox plan was used as a guide when the other letters were sent from the governor to the counties that were on the the, the frontier on the on border between 
the United States of the Native people, but they would use something similar to the Knoxville can. Yes, sir. Have you found any symbols of a well? Uh, of a well? Well, no. Um, as I said, we had the river. The mouth of the Appalachian River is right about four. About 200 feet. Oh, Our next thing is trying to find the latrine. What do they use the bathroom? Are there any other questions about Fort Daniel? Okay, was there actually a road built forward from where? Yes. Where did it start? Augusta somewhere? There was a road from Augusta to uh, Hog Mountain. And then from Hog Mountain to uh, Beach Street. Fort Peach Tree, and then from, then from Fort Peach Tree, the plan was it was to go down the river on a boat to Fort Mitchell. And then from Fort Mitchell, the supplies were giving out. However, it was never, it never happened because the, the war road, ended. The road, the road never happened. The road was built, yes, yes, but the supply route was never happened because of, um, you know, if you've been to, to Columbus, you got the been down the Chattahoochee, you got the falls. Yeah. So the, the boat would reach there yeah. at Fort Mitchell. Because the Fort Mitchell is right below the falls. Um, and then the conflict, the Muscogee conflict did end. Their civil war did end. And um, Andrew Jackson went on to New Orleans, mm -hmm. de defeated the British there. I just want to ask a quick question, Jack. Was Skull Shoals, wasn't that the western edge of the United States? It time? was at that time. This, the, the fort built, the built there was in 1793, yes. I believe. Fort Daniel was the, the, Hog Mountain was the southern <clears throat> most point at the at the 1800s. But yeah, and the Shoals, oh, yeah. Coney River. Skull Shoals was only a Coney River Shoals. Yeah. Whatever. That was at the, the late 1700s. The, the governor authorized the building of uh, forts along the Oconee at five mile intervals. Mm -hmm. And um, whoever was authorizing, I forget who now, uh, contracted with a young lieutenant cook to build the fort. And we found the uh, contract specifications and the uh, but there wasn't really a map. It was just a verbal description. And then, supposedly, after he finished, there is a uh, military inspector came out and inspected the job. And as you can imagine, it was a little short. But it was... <laughs> yeah. We do have the documentation for that sort of thing. Yeah. I wish we had a map. Yeah, it was, it was like, it was probably that map that I showed earlier in the Tony War map. Franklin County is probably similar yeah. to that. What was the date before Knox, or I'm uh, sorry, the Knox plan? The Knox plan was as given to the uh, to the governor of Georgia in 1794. 1794, and uh, but it was never used. Year, but we didn't. I, and, hmm? We should have had something like that too if that plan. Yeah, it was supposed to, but the, as I said, the, the governor, there's documentation from the governor's office file notes saying that he just wanted to just file it away. Yeah. He did not want to do what the United States government said to do, get a member of states' rights. Yeah. Well, the governor's been having problems like that ever since. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but as a layer on, they remember that they had that plan. Uh, some people believe that Knox really did not design the plan. Mm -hmm. Because you remember who the president was, Washington? Mm -hmm. And he was very familiar with frontier fortifications, especially during the French and Indian War that he was part of when he was a British. So young soldier during that time. So he probably used his knowledge to advise Knox. Mm -hmm. Surveyor. Yeah. yeah, it was a survey, yeah. So some, that's what some believe that probably Pres President Washington actually did the plan. <laughs> Not. 
We don't have proof of that. I wanted to ask you about what kinds of things you found in that root cellar. Everything, basically. <laughs> All the silverware that we found, um, a lot of pottery. So basically when the fort was abandoned, they just threw everything in there. We found a lot of uh, chamber pots in there. Um, so it came with, it came up. I don't trash, trash in here. Trash mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Did you find any cars? Yeah. Yeah, I remember this is the Georgia militia. This is the locally man by the man by local people. Okay. So probably they were there for usually they rotated every two weeks, ten days, something like that. So they were probably brought supplies from home. We do know that Elijah Wynn, who was living that far from the house, if you ever been to Elijah Wynn House, which is where the county seat was at the time, uh, well, when Gwinnett County was founded, uh, but he, we do, did find some at the state archives saying an IOU, basically, that he gave meat to the fort, but probably the men's wives or children brought food to them. Or if they need supplies. Is there a, a most of those were farmsteads or homesteads around the forest? Yeah. Or were there any any evidence of any like small towns near there? There was a training post. Uh, I apologize, but there was a training post not far. Okay. Uh, if you three twenty four and one twenty four. Uh, was the place called Crossroads? So there was a train post somewhere around there. We don't know for sure. And we do know from some, um, there was a certain newspaper clipping stating that the train post was raided by two drunken Cherokee. So basically, two Cher Cherokee who were very drunk broke into the train post, stole some things, but not much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that area is out there near Hamilton, Hamilton Mill, correct? Yes. And when did the mill come to operation as compared to Ford? Did you know that? That is probably later on in the 18, mid, almost the mid 1800s, but maybe 1830s, 1840s. So the county was founded, it said, the county was founded in 1819. So that's where we're able to move further, closer to Atlanta, further west. So it's probably around that time. I don't know about it. The um, can you talk for a few minutes about the SGA? Yes, the Society for Georgia Archaeology is basically a nonprofit organization that's made up of professional archaeologists, amateur archaeologists, whoever who wants to be part of it. But also there's there's chapters. There's probably about six or seven chapters. I was told earlier we did have Bragg and have Greater Atlanta, and have Gars. We also have a couple others. We like have Augusta, and then some down south as well. Uh, and these chapters are made up, you know, of everyday people. And the SGA is just an organization that tried to help. Us educate the public about like Fort Daniel, about archaeological sites and historical resources. Also we try to I wouldn't say lobby, but promote. Promote is a better word. Thank you. Make people aware of things that happen, especially if like legislatures have happening in a, the state Senate or state House of Representatives. Things that feels going through that might endanger sites, historical resources. About 25 or 30 years ago, there was an effort. Uh, I'm not sure where that came from, but to sort of do away with a lot of the money that went to the historic preservation program in the state and the professional archaeologists and the Rand Brown put on up for you rallied around and got the, the amateurs as well to write to their state representatives. And there was a, a an effective 
change in the government to uh, actually fund cultural resources management in Georgia. Uh, what, didn't this involve you, Richard? Wasn't this one of you with that? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Richard was working in the office yeah. in Atlanta, and it, it went from very little to what three or four times as big as it was, what didn't it? Yeah. Well, that expanded to a, a whole program on historic structures and, and a, another program on prehistoric materials, sites, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the trouble is in the last 25 years or so, that's dwindled back down again. So we're we're almost where we were before. But the one of the reasons that, if I understood it, the reason that S, the Society for Georgia Archaeology existed was to bring together people who were working on Georgia archaeology. They were professionals from several different states, in fact, who were working in Georgia. And, uh, and the people who were leading archaeology programs in the various universities, or very many at that point, it's mostly UGA, but, mm -hmm. but there was a major program at, at Macon for the old Mogi uh, Indian Mount Complex mm -hmm. there. And so they, they were frequently met there. But it was uh, an annual meeting, or yeah, I guess it was an annual meeting of anybody who was interested, but it was principally the, the, uh, the paid professionals, and there weren't very many of them, but the interested amateurs, uh, some of them are dilettantes perhaps, but they were people who were willing and, and, and uh, able to put some sort of effort into recording the prehistory of Georgia. Mm -hmm. And it's been going since, what, the 50s, I guess. I think maybe it started earlier than that, and it died out, and then it got picked up again. Oh, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I think one of the earliest but it, early Georgias are like in the forties. The, well, there's yes, uh, the the two things uh, that a member gets besides attending these meetings is uh, the profile, which is the newsletter that you're doing, and a book called Early Georgia. Early Georgia. It's a journal that includes reports of um, projects in the state. Some of them are short reports of, of small projects, and some of them are major tomes. I think this is coming out to about 200 pages, isn't it? Yes. No. This should be. Yes. It, it's just a bunch of different papers, but it's it still is amazing. Papers professionals and also some students. Yeah. It's also a way for students who are majoring in archaeology to write up so they get the experience to writing yes, absolutely. reports and they be published as well. Mm -hmm. Be a good thing on their little resume. There you go. And we, I, know, the, I think the next one should be coming out this summer. This is coming up. Well, it's, it, unfortunately, because of the uh, because of the uh, oh, is, everything got slowed down yeah. for two or three years and so now what we're, we're looking for is the 2020, 21, and 22 editions. Yes. And I think it'll help us 23 is supposed to still come out this year? No, 23 will be coming out next year. Next year, okay. Um, 20, I believe 20 and 21, or 21 and 22 are combined. Mm, okay. We're saying combined. There's still two different publications, but they're be printing at the same time, yeah. make into one. It, yeah. It's it's one mailing network. One mailing, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. You know what we I have a few of the back issues. What I could do is bring them in and share them around so people can see what they were. Now that doesn't mean that the two was to look at the old ones, but it's a lot of idea with the kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. If you yeah, if you are looking for old ones, those are housed at this time at the University of Georgia. Yeah, well they're all over there, aren't they? Yes. But we're trying to digitize house all of them on to. We what actually does. Mm -hmm. oh, good. We, got, we got interns from college students, graduate has, students. Has students. anybody tried to digitize the profile? Yes. Oh, good. Uh, what portions of it is? is I think uh, all of them are because I have a lot. Wonderful. Okay. Oh, no. Where are they located? Sad. What? Have most of them. <laughs> um, we are hoping to put all of them online. Uh, we are having we are we do have a website in progress trying to get that updated and every 
everything online. So you're going to put them on the SGA website? Yes. Mm -hmm. What's the next SGA meeting going to be? We used to be twice a year? We used to be twice a year. Uh, then we started to do, we decided to do once a year so that we can have a fall meeting instead of have one in May, which usually was. So we can just, because May is archaeology month. So you can't as much. Um, but we're thinking that we might have one in the fall down south um, to near, uh, 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 where's that a park now? A bulgy. Yeah. yeah. We should use park, yeah, now I'm down there. We that's so I'm making yeah for for some some years they met one time in Macon and the other time somewhere else in the state yeah so the uh, central it would be yeah Macon is centrally located but but people are scattered all over the place and so sometimes they'd be yeah we're still going to probably just do once a year and do yeah. different yeah parts of the state that that is our plan trying to do different areas of the state. It's neat to go way down deep in the south, but there's so few people down there that it makes it hard on everybody else. As far as I met Jack Quinn in Macon, uh, I think it was in the summer of 2010, possibly. This crazy man was running around this auditorium looking place, smoking t shirts. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you remember to remember that. Did you get shut up, did you? Yeah, doing a good job of it too. Though. Actually, I still prefer no more t-shirts. <laughs> but um, put a little plug in for Daniel. We are having an open house public archaeology event uh, May twentieth. So not this Saturday, but next Saturday. Uh, it's from ten to two. So if you want to come down and see me in my archaeology outfit. Probably have a flyer about there's flyers up here. Also, there's some brochures about the Society of Georgia Archaeology here. Want some information about that? I'll let I'll keep those uh, the brochures here for y'all just for future. Thank you. And so well, thank y'all for having me. Thank you. Thank you. SGA event or GARS events, and hopefully one day we might have a GARS brag event together, along with gas. You maybe do, I say maybe a lithic, another lithic workshop or a ceramic workshop. That's so 